The Black Sheep at its heart is a series that is almost tailor-made for film franchises. Yeah, sure, we cover the redhead stepchild, a forgotten genre gem from an actor or director's catalog that maybe stands out for the wrong kind of reasons. But we discuss an awful lot of sequels here. I mean, we must. These films need to be measured for their own enjoyment rather than against a stone-cold classic found within its own series. Now, what we usually don't discuss is the first film of a given franchise. I mean, how can you be the black sheep of a franchise you started? Well, if you have a great idea that is only expanded on and fully realized better in future movies, then uh, it kind of have to be. Which brings us to today's entry, 2013's The Purge. Now, hold on, don't judge me yet, because you may be as surprised as I was to see that out of the four current Purge films, and how often does that happen? And this is not for a lack of trying. The Purge has a story that is fresh, even if it is a simple siege story. And listen, there's nothing wrong with siege films. If you can pull them off like the original Assault on Pre-Saint 13, then you could have exploitation gold. It's just that the crux of the premise, you know, a 12 hour period in which every type of crime is made legal for the betterment of society is much better seen in the macro sense rather than the micro one. Now, the writer and director, James DeMonaco, has that wider vision as he wrote all four films, the upcoming fifth, and the TV series. Before he did this, he even wrote the screenplay for the 2005 remake of Assault on Precinct 13. And I guess the flow and feel of the first film isn't exactly a coincidence then. This also sports fun turns from the legendary, and I can't stress that enough, this is the f***ing man, Mr. Ethan Hawke and Game of Thrones standout, Lena Headey. Didn't you hear what I said? No more killing tonight! As the mom and dad of the main family, The Purge opens up with a black screen explaining that America in the year 2022 has solved all of its problems. Eh, not bad. Unemployment is down to about 1%, crime is the lowest it's ever been, and there is almost no violence. Almost. We then get video footage of what anyone would consider brutal and violent, but in fact, it is all sanctioned as once a year, for 12 hours, legal crime under a new governmental system dubbed the New Founding Fathers. We then see Ethan Hawke's character heading home to be with his family before the purge starts. I would have taken the day off myself. He's made good money designing high-end security systems designed to be deterrents during the yearly carnage, and he and his family live in a nice house in a very nice neighborhood because of it. And I dig the choice by the director here to show off what the event looks like from a family that can afford to protect itself, rather than go the expected route and have the point of view from the underdog, which is done well in the sequels, but it is cool to start on the higher end here. His daughter Zoe is dating an older boy, which he hates, I would agree, and his son questions the need for the purge at all. Now, another pair of good choices is one of these problems is a common relatable one, while the other sits firmly in the mythos of the film, while still tying into the inquisitive nature of kids. The family has dinner and prepares for the night. They even watch the countdown together with the rules. Yes, rules for a 12-hour crime spree are laid out in a scrolling list on TV. After the purge begins, they even rotate footage from across the country of what's going on outside. I guess even people that don't want to participate will still get a, you know, a little bit of a show, which I kind of think is another fun commentary in our culture. Zoe's older boyfriend, Henry, hid himself in the house to force her father to have a talk with him about he and his daughter's relationship. But the real action starts when Charlie sees a wonderful stranger show up at the house and beg for help. As he is already shown to question the madness, Charlie, of course, disables his security system and goes to help the man out. And as someone who lives in a major city, it's gonna be kind of cold, but uh, you know, let him die. James goes out to shoo him away, but is surprised and attacked by Henry, who decided killing James legally in the 12 hour window was easier than talking. <laughs> I mean, and this is something I also like. How many stories have you heard of daughters convincing their boyfriends to murder their father? But in The Purge, they're gonna use the legality of the system for it. But then Henry is shot and killed by James in the first shocking move of the film. And this comes out of nowhere too and really kickstarts the action. And a group of purgers show up to collect their prize and threaten to kill everyone in the house if they don't hand over the drifter. 
Their explanation of why it's okay to kill him simply because he is homeless is not the most subtle political message, but goes a long way to show off how sadistic people can get during the night. Mr. and Mrs. The man you're sheltering is nothing but a dirty homeless pig. A grotesque menace to our just society who had the audacity to fight back, killing one of us when we attempted to execute him tonight. Now, anyone that has seen a movie before will know that their family will not end up giving another human being over to be slaughtered. But in The Purge's defense, it happens quickly rather than after showing some cliched scene that changes the characters' minds. It's more just a snap decision and the consequences that follow. Knowing that the group outside is serious, and that his own designed security is more of a deterrent than an actual fortified compound, he prepares his family to defend themselves. At first, it seems that they are all doing well. As the armed strangers break into the house, the family handles business with relative ease. Except for the son, because of course, the kids have to suck in a horror movie. James briefly turns into Ethan Hawke's character from Training Day and takes out three intruders in a row during the film's best action set piece. I never saved anything for the swim back. Before getting stabbed by the leader. Mary is captured by the strange pair of intruders because she is significantly less John Wick than her husband. But before the main girl can use machete to go for the kill, the assailants are shot dead. Now she isn't saved by the daughter or the homeless stranger, but by the neighbors we last saw gossiping about the family in the beginning of the movie. And in a second fun twist, the family is saying goodbye to the patriarch James, but the neighbors let them know they are actually here to kill them. The truth is you're ours, not theirs. James is dead. Mary and the kids will have to do. Let's tie them up, we'll kill them right here. <laughs> Again, it's a little heavy handed with the whole there's a killer deep inside of all of us trope, but it's a fun switch you may not see coming and is executed surprisingly well. But before anything could come of that, however, the man they save from the Purge gang rescues the family and they all sit in awkward conversation until the Purge period is over. Well, minus one last dish effort by the thirstiest for violence of all the neighbors, which ends in a gun butt sandwich. The movie closes out with bodies being taken away and the family left to pick up the pieces of their life without the ability to do anything about the atrocities done to them. This is followed by a voiceover laid on top of the credits showing the horrific violence that befell the country and the apparent success that it will bring. Now to bring this home, the movie has some great things going for it. The idea is solid and was successful enough to convince Blumhouse, which was a relatively new player to the horror game, to give this writer slash director the keys to the franchise. And I think you gotta understand how incredibly rare this is. John Carpenter exited the Halloween franchise after the failure part three. Hooper bailed after two. And Craven mostly stayed clear of Freddy, minus a little help with Dream Warriors. And turning in one of my favorite entries with New Nightmare. Really, the only pure example is what Don Coscarelli did with the Phantasm entries. But with The Purge, I, I really think the biggest success is the cast. Ethan Hawke, Lena Headey, and Reese Wakefield are all stand-up performers with special credit given to Wakefield. When not purging, this guy's inviting you onto his lawyer's dad's boat for a sick party. The movie doesn't waste any time either. It sets up its rules and universe and dives right into it with a taut thriller less than 90 minutes. The biggest problem is that it's the least Purge-like of all the Purge entries. If you removed these elements, you would still have a nice little home invasion thriller. But it does lack the nationwide impact of seeing all this happen in major cities across the country. Fans of the series that went back and watched this where it all started were probably underwhelmed. And hey, they ain't wrong in the scope of the series. But this movie needs to get its own love for what it is rather than what it isn't. May not give you all the trademarks of the series, but it's still a well-crafted horror movie that gave Blumhouse one of its best properties and arguably gave them the cash to branch out into bigger and better things. Show this to a horror enthusiast who hasn't seen it, or maybe just go back yourself and watch a truly underrated movie, even within its own series. Hey, thanks for watching our show. 
please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content. And turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support.